Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, I'm delighted that you can all be here tonight for this special and important occasion. Today, we, we will be presenting the 2019 Gleitzman Award to Tarana Burke, the civil rights activist and founder of the global Me Too movement for survivors of sexual assault. For more than a decade, Tarana Burke has done vital work on behalf of all of us in raising awareness about sexual violence and the impact of such violence on everyone, and especially on the most marginalized among us. Along with other female activists, she was the Time Person of the Year for 2017, among many, many other honors. And tonight, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to recognize her ourselves and to learn from her in person. The Gleitzman Award was launched a quarter century ago by Alan Gleitzman and his life partner, Sherry Roche. Alan established the Gleitzman Foundation to support social change that improves people's lives. The Gleitzman Award recognizes the accomplishments of social activists who have inspired others and shaped our world for the better. Alan once said that the purpose of the award is to, quote, recognize people who make a difference, tell their story, and make other people aware of what one person can do." Unquote. In 2006, Alan and Sherry decided that the Gleitzman Award needed an academic home, and they made a generous gift to the Center for Public Leadership here at Harvard Kennedy School. Their gift has enabled the Center to continue the award program and to share the lessons of the awardees with our community here and with the broader community across the country and around the world. Past winners include Malala Yousafzai, Nelson Mandela, Gloria Steinem, and Congressman John Lewis. Alan and Sherry's generous gift also allows us to bring students who are social activists to the Kennedy School as Gleitzman Leadership Fellows, uh, many of whom are in the audience here tonight. Welcome to all of you. And we have a professorship named in honor of Alan as well. That chair is currently held by Julie Batalana, who is also with us this evening. Uh, the director of the Center for Public Leadership, whom I will turn this uh, evening over to in a moment, uh, is Wendy Sherman. Wendy is a professor of the practice of public leadership here at the Kennedy School. We are lucky to have persuaded Wendy to join us here as the latest stage of her distinguished career in public service. Uh, Wendy was the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs and led the team of Americans who negotiated the nuclear deal with Iran. Earlier in her career, she was a social worker who assisted battered women and troubled families, and she was the state of Maryland's first director of child welfare. She was also the chief of staff to then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski and later campaign manager for Mikulski's first successful Senate campaign. Throughout her career, Wendy Sherman has shown a commitment to principled and effective public leadership. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium, where she will introduce our 2019 Gleitzman Award recipient. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I always start my classes. It's in the morning. I say good morning. I want everybody to say good morning back, because it wakes up. So good evening. Good evening. One more time, good evening. It is great to be with you all here this evening um, and to welcome you to this very special event. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge, welcome, and thank a few of the people in this room. Of course, the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, Doug Elmendorf, uh, who's known around here as Doug. <laughs> um, the academic dean, Iris Bonnet, who is right there. Um, the Gleitzman professor, Julie Badalana, that Doug already mentioned, Institute of Politics director who really owns the forum, Mark Guerin, <laughs> our 2019 Gleitzman Award judges. These are public nominations, and then a group of faculty working with me and my staff make a set of decisions and make sure it's okay with the dean, and then go forward. I also want to thank a former Gleitzman Award winner, an anti-tobacco activist, Jeffrey 
Wygant, who is here with us this evening. Where's Jeffrey? I think. Maybe he's on that red line I hear that's stuck. <laughs> um, also want to thank the Boston area and Harvard organizations on campus that came for the Community Resource Fair earlier today that serve and support those affected by sexual violence. One of the things that the organizations told us this afternoon is that they're rarely in the same room together the Harvard systems and the community systems. And bringing them all here together gave them a chance to talk to each other, as well as to talk to our community here at Harvard Kennedy School. I want to welcome Tarana's daughter, Kaya Burke. <laughs> and I want to welcome our award winner, Tarana Burke, has been working at the intersection of racial justice and gender equity for nearly three decades. She started as a child. <laughs> Fueled by a commitment to interrupt sexual violence and other systemic issues disproportionately impacting marginalized people, particularly black women and girls, Tarana has created and led campaigns that have brought awareness to the harmful legacies surrounding communities of color. Throughout her early activism as a young woman in Alabama, Tarana realized too many girls were suffering through abuse without access to resources, safe spaces, and support. In 2007, she created Just Be, an organization committed to the empowerment and wellness of those girls. The Me Too movement was born shortly thereafter as an entry to healing for survivors and a way for young people to share their stories. In 2017, when Me Too as a hashtag went viral, Tarana emerged as a global leader in the evolving conversation around sexual violence. She intentionally placed the focus on survivors and the need for survivor-centered, survivor-led solutions. Her theory of empowerment through empathy is changing the world we all think, the way all of us in the world think and talk about sexual violence, consent, and body autonomy. Importantly, her work has served to increase access to resources and support for survivors and paved a way forward for everyone to find their place in the movement. And so tonight, I'm going to call Tarana and Doug back up in a moment. We honor Tarana's overwhelming impact and courageous activism with Harvard's Gleitzman Citizen Activist Award. This award, this right here, was a specially commissioned sculpture, sculpture by Maya Lin the creator of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. In addition to this sculpture, because of the largesse of Alan Gleitzman and Sherry Roche, Tarana will receive a personal check for $125,000. So, Tarana Burke, Dean Elmendorf, if you will join me on stage. <laughs> this is yours now. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. I can take this for you. Thank you. So now uh, Tarana gets to say a couple of short words, but then she and I are going to be in conversation around these issues for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then open it up to all of you, and I'll give you in the instructions for that Q&A in a minute. Tarana Burke, our Gleitzman Award winner. Thank you. Oh. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no, do that. Thank you. Y'all gonna make me emotional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Okay, Harvard, y'all not gonna make me emotional tonight. Um, whew, thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Doug. Th thank you to everybody. I um I had a wonderful day on campus today. It was um so enlightening and inspiring, really, to meet some of the students that are coming out of these programs um, and to see what's happening. People outside of Harvard have their own ideas of what Harvard is and what's happening on this campus. So to actually be inside and see the kind of innovation and social justice work that's being cooked up here is really, it's nice. It was nice to see and nice to be a part of that experience. Um, I usually have prepared remarks when I come and it's so, and this usually for your benefit, not mine, because I'll go on forever and ever. So I'm gonna try not to do that, uh, save it for our conversation. Uh, I am, I know there's a lot of excitement in the air right now and a sort of renewed energy after this Weinstein verdict, but I need y'all to calm down. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> and I guess we'll talk some more about that, but I am really grateful for where we are. Thinking that, you know, my girlfriend Latasha Brown is in the audience and I'm sure half of y'all know her here because that's <laughs> Tasha Brown. Um, but Latasha and I started this work together very much uh, in Alabama a long time ago. We won't talk about decades. <laughs> and it's so exciting for us to be here together and to see how that work has fully evolved and see that the world is finally caught up to where we, we stayed in the grassroots and the world is finally caught up to it. So um, I'm just excited. And um, yeah, I guess we can, we can, we can chat, we can wrap a taste now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I also, I also want to make clear, my baby got very excited around that check. <laughs> Personal. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's for your mom. It's for mama. Speaking for all the moms here. Thank you. It's for your mom. My daughter's here too. <laughs> so, Tarana, I said this to you earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, Tarana, Sarah Wald, uh, who everybody here knows, policy advisor to Doug and chief of staff, chaired an off-the-record meeting with the Title IX and the OSAPR. I always forget what OSAPR stands for, but it's all <laughs> of our resources to protect and help uh, people who are confronted with sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot. And what I think would and it had, has me thinking about how I listen about these issues and what we can do. And I wonder, you know, Harvard, I know people think Harvard's a perfect place. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> and I, I would really appreciate if you could share with this audience because you've now been to colleges and universities all over this country. I think you told us yeah. maybe by now 200 Almost of them. 200, yeah. What do you think institutions like Harvard, though there's nothing like Harvard, <laughs> but what, what institutions can do to get better at meeting the needs of those survivors you have spent your life trying to help? It, uh, really, in a, to be succinct, because we could like parse out a lot of um, details around that. I think there's so much opportunity on college campuses, but particularly institutions like Harvard that sits as a leader. And, you know, there are some institutions that when they um, make changes, other people follow and they set a standard. I think these kind of institutions can have, and I'm not saying that you don't, but can have a modicum of courage that they haven't had in the past. And, and, and that, well, you can clap for that. But that, what that looks okay like. To applaud that. But what that can look like is what I said in the in the meeting. So much happens on college campuses. This it's a microcosm of the world. But you have these small communities that you can 
try out new things in, that you can, that you can take a step to the side. I forgot how many colleges they said and universities are within Harvard. <laughs> a lot. A, a lot, right? Imagine if you just said in two or three of those, we're going to pilot this different way of um, looking at accountability. We're going to, you know, we have Title IX, but we want to try something different to, to talk about a, a different framework for approaching this. I think institutions, colleges and universities across the country have to be a little more courageous and have to be afraid, not be afraid to, to fail, right? <clears throat> because we, what happens, what we know from colleges and, inst and institutions is that you learn from your mistakes. These are the places where you fail and people, you don't just fail here, it gets evaluated, right? You talk about it, you pick it apart, you try to understand where the failure came from and then you do it again. And we need some of that innovation and some of that courage um, in this moment, and then when you fail, say, we tried this thing and it didn't work. Be transparent about that so that people can see that, you know, I think, understand the process that you're going through and we're gonna try something else. I would love to see that happen on more college campuses because this is the, it's ripe for that kind of dreaming. And we tell the students all the time, come here and dream and innovate and be different and blah, blah, blah. And then the institutions are rigid and like, well, you know, Title IX says we can't do that, so we just won't. Not saying y'all do that, but it's, it's what I see at a lot of college campuses, so it would be great to see a different kind of innovation. You mentioned in this answer the issue of accountability, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the Harvey Weinstein case this week, which was certainly about one kind of accountability. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that case was for you and what it wasn't, and what you think we learned from it and what you think we missed? So, I mean, you know, I remember the, obviously, prior, the days prior to Me Too going viral, I was just another citizen, <laughs> and I was, I remember seeing on social media um, this fight, this, this sort of controversy that was happening because some actress called for a day of silence for, they wanted all women not to tweet that, uh, y'all remember this? It was like they, when they called for all women not to tweet that Friday. They say it was mm -hmm. like a Friday. Mm -hmm. And the immediate reaction from black women and other women of color was, why? Why should we be in solidarity with you in this moment around this Hollywood case when you all haven't been in solidarity with us over several different things that have erupted online? And I just, I mean, I was, I'm not, I was sort of observing <laughs> from the side. I thought it was really interesting. And so when, um, you know, I remember reading the articles around the case and thought I felt for the women in the articles just because the stories were just so terrible, just like anybody else, just empathy. But I did not feel connected personally mm. to it. Like I think many people did. It was, a, it was a story. It was like, I'm glad this is exposed. And then when, um, you know, after Me Too goes viral and, and I start meeting some of these people, some of the women who would come forward, I felt very connected just because that's what happens when you meet people in real life, right? They come out of the fantasy or the movies or your television and they're real people. And I saw them as just survivors, just women who have been through things that I've been through who are just trying to live, put one foot in front of the other. And so in that regard, I wanted for them what I want for all survivors. I wanted some catharsis. I wanted some healing. You know, I wanted to, to try to be, um, help them find this road to, to back to themselves like I do for other people. So in that way, the case took on a, a level of importance personally because I felt connected to them. But in the larger sense, I realized in the last two years that so many people, for different reasons, were riding on the outcome of this case as a judgment of the entire movement. And so what it's not, <laughs> Is, a, is an indictment or, or even um, of, of the movement, of what Me Too is. I read something today where somebody wrote an op-ed that said we're moving into the next phase of the, the justice phase of the Me Too movement. And I thought that's so short-sighted. One, there's not a survivor out here who doesn't want some form of justice. Our justice looks different though. Just, it, just, it just looks different for different people. But what we want more than justice, and there's data to, to back this up, is healing. We want a, a pathway back to ourselves and feeling whole. Most survivors don't think punitively. They don't think, the first thought is not, I want to get him or her. It is, I want to get this thing out of me. 
And so there's a way that we can get caught up in this verdict. I've, you know, I've seen, I have talked to Annabelle Esquire, I'm not trying to like name drop, but I've talked to these people and they're not okay. And the media will portray one thing, but I know that their lives are not, not, they weren't like popping champagne bottles and cartwheeling in the street when this verdict came out. They were so scared that their lives were gonna be torn apart through the process of the trial that so many of them were like, I almost don't wish I didn't have to do this. So, so I still see it as a way to look at how we think about, talk about, and support survivors of sexual violence. It's, you know, regardless of whether you're an abolitionist or a whatever, people have the right to want the kind of justice they want. I'm not here to say one way to be the judge, one way to other from my personal beliefs, but, but when you get it, the thing that happens to most survivors is when you get the thing you think you want, you realize you needed something else. Mm -hmm. And so this is a moment where we need to be clear that we can't put all our eggs in this basket. This, this verdict is, is a victory in some ways for the people who are involved. And symbolically, it is a, um, you know, we don't have to deal with people saying, what about Weinstein anymore, even though they found a new reason to say that. But, <clears throat> you know, there's some symbolic, um, there's this, this symbolism in it that is important, and I think it will, it's a shot in the arm for people to kind of be like, oh, Me Too isn't dead, even though we you know, still, still here doing this work. And so that way I'm grateful. Can you talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. how people like me, mm -hmm. a white, privileged, middle-class person. I was say, you gotta person, be more clear, okay. No, 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 <laughs> I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be specific. A white, privileged, middle-class woman like mm -hmm. me, how, I can't see some of what you have spent your life doing. And part of what you started in the Harvey Weinstein discussion mm -hmm. was all, all good, good for those women if it helped them through this journey mm -hmm. of healing. Right. But it, and you could relate woman to woman to their need to survive and to heal, mm -hmm. but that the needs of women of color is a different story. Oh, absolutely. Or can you talk I, about that a little more? Well, I mean, <laughs> Wendy, okay. I know it's your life. <laughs> I know it's your life. Well, the, the reality is most survivors won't see the inside of a courtroom, right? But absolutely, most women of color won't even get to the process to, to, to file a claim or to go through the, the, any, any sort of judicial process at all. We have so many layers. This is what, where intersectionality really comes in, right? People aren't intersectional. This is, this is like when you're talking about being, I'm just speaking in a gendered way for a moment. If I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, I have to, once I experience the harm, whatever it is, the, the nine times out of 10, and this, this is a real statistic, it is another person who looks like me that caused the harm. And so now I have to contend with do I, do I initiate a process that will put this person who I probably know, because most of us know the people who cause us harm, in the justice system? We have been socialized in, in both you as a, as a white, middle class, blah, 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 privileged woman. <laughs> you know, I have been socialized most of my life to protect you. I have been socialized most of my life to defer to your pain, even, even whether, white men, black men, black women, we have been socialized to respond to the vulnerability of white women. And because of that, we put, we put aside so many things and we push forward, right? This is the thing most black women can, res can, can resonate with. You just push forward. And I think, I think a lot about, <laughs> I'm writing my memoir now, and so I've been thinking a lot about what was missing as a young black girl growing up. What was missing? What didn't I have? What didn't, and what didn't I, it still wasn't available when I started doing this work. And if you talk to a lot of black women, there is a, um, probably another older black woman in their life mm -hmm. who kept them from see, you know, telling their story or going out in the world and blah. And not because they didn't love them, but more so because they loved them and because they understood the ramifications of that. These are the things you can't see because you can't see in our interior lives. And most people aren't invested in, our, in the material lives of black women, right? We are adornment, 
we are, we undergird, we hold up, we soldier through, but we don't have a soft place to land. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult um, burden to carry. And I've been put in this, this really terrible position, I think, as a person who is at the forefront of this and has become sort of the face of this movement, to have this infighting that's happening in my community that I can't even talk to you about, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't even have this conversation in detail because it's just too, you know, we don't discuss certain things. Right, it's not, <laughs> so it's not, it, it's, 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 it feels disloyal in Well, some yeah, ways. and it's not really for public consumption, but mm -hmm. there is a private conversation that needs to happen in our community that's not happening. Mm -hmm. And every day that it doesn't happen, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And so a big part of my job in this moment is trying to figure out how to have those conversations. And for the first time in my life, I have had, I have had, I have this dual responsibility, which is really interesting of um, being completely loyal to and, and attentive to my community and having to be for the world. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting, but it's also a huge Burden. It, I mean, I, I don't know what to call it. It doesn't feel like a burden, right? Because I also know that had I not been raised in this work the way I was raised in, and had black women not nurtured me in this work and turned me into an organizer, I wouldn't know how to do it. I wouldn't know how to tend to my folks and tend to the world at the same time. There's some, there's some burdensome part of it, but also I can't say that I'm working on behalf of survivors and it not be all survivors. That's just not possible. And there's nothing that a white woman, what I found out in these last two years, the white women in Hollywood who came forward, who have all the privilege and all the money and all the blah, 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 they needed the same things that these little black girls in Selma, Alabama needed when I started this work. It's not really different. This trauma is, it is blind, right? This is why I say all the time, sexual violence doesn't discriminate. It's the response to sexual violence that we have to pay attention to. <laughs> so I ask you one more question and then I'm going to turn to the audience and um, because it's precious for you all to get a chance to ask questions, not just me. Uh, there are four microphones, two down here and two up in the rafters. Uh, so people, if you want to start to line up, you can. And um, just so you all know, uh, my colleagues know I have a rule. If the first two questions are from guys, I'm going to stop until a woman gets a chance to ask a question. So, um, oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just remember, when I turn to you all, uh, questions end with a question mark. <laughs> they are short and pithy, <laughs> uh, and so that we can get in a lot of questions. And press are not allowed to ask questions here in the forum. So really want to focus on students and the community to ask questions. Um, so my question to you before we start here mm -hmm. is, given that the response is different, mm -hmm. that there is still a lot of work to be done in meeting the needs of survivors, what do you think is most needed to do that? I think that we have to have what I've, re what I've realized in the last two years is that more than, you know, getting the perpetrators or naming the people and all, the world does not really understand what it looks like to survive. They don't understand what survival looks like, what it feels like, what it costs. And I mean, not just from an emotional place, from a very real place in that, you know, these are people who are going to be jurors, who are gonna be jurists who are gonna affect our lives in various ways with very little information about what it looks like to carry this thing. And I think that the empathy part and empowerment through empathy works better if people have more information. You think that you're far away from this thing, but you're not. You are not. I promise you, if you are not a survivor, you know one, or both. And so in order for us to move the needle, I mean, there's lots of work that has to be done, but I think it is vital that we take a step back. We have so much misinformation. And, and I, I talk about this often, and my aha moment was during the Kavanaugh hearing, mm -hmm. when, I, when I met this liberal woman in the bathroom who 
I thought we were <laughs> commiserating about what we had just witnessed, and I was in the, I was there, what we had just witnessed in the um, room. And she turned to me and said, I just wish that she was a little more credible. I wish that she could remember some more details. I just, you know, just to make it so that they could, just so we can get, and I said, <laughs> um, when I realized that we were not on the same side of the coin, <laughs> I said, I never talk about my personal story, because mm -hmm. it's really nobody's business. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't have to hear the gory details of my life to have empathy for what I'm telling you I'm carrying. Mm -hmm. So my story is not, you know, when I'm ready and when I want to, I tell it. But I said to her, I said, you know what? People who know me, my friends, they can, they can testify that I have one of the worst memories ever. If you tell me something, you don't write it down, you don't put it in my, I'm just, it's gone. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, I, I, I eat almonds, I'm trying ginkgo biloba, it's just not, it's not, <laughs> doesn't work. And I, I always feel bad about that. But when I started doing this, this work on myself, going to therapy, going to this, I realized that I have such a terrible memory because I have spent 40 years trying to forget. I've been, every day of my life, I want to know less and less and less. I don't want those details. So the fact, even when I think about it now, I just get, ugh. The fact that this woman got up here in this room full of people who, who really don't care about her, and I mean the whole circle. It wasn't just half the room that didn't care about her, right? She got up in this room full of people and told as much as she could and poured her heart out. And you still want more. You don't understand what that took. And I think if people understood what our lives were like, because we are also mothering and lawyering and teaching and doing all the things, right, while we are holding this, and most of the time holding it at bay. People don't get that. People don't see it. I always, I'm dramatic, so I call us the walking wounded. But it is because our wounds are on the inside. When somebody, when, when a child, I'm, I'm, I'm going to my preacher mode, I'm sorry, but it's just like, <laughs> but when a, when a child is shot in the street in a community, people rally around that family. We see it all the time. You say, and the people in the community say, this is, this is unconscionable. We cannot have children being shot in the street. They feel very connected to the, to their, they connect their own safety to that. And they say, we can't live in a community where children aren't even safe. We gotta get these guns off the street, right? They hold space for the parents and they, and they come out and they do night vigils and community you know, meetings and things like that. I have seen whole communities come together around gun violence, as they should. What happens when a child is molested in a community? There's silence. And the silence gets passed on and people say, don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. We don't know what really happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what kind of family they come from. Well, you've seen what kind of person this is. It is the opposite reaction. People don't connect their own safety to that, to that situation, but more so, we don't feel accountable. We don't feel responsible. When, some, when there's gun violence and other kind of drugs, all these other kind of things that are in our community, we feel some personal responsibility. And this is why people don't fight around sexual violence the way they should, because we don't see it as a social justice issue. It's an individual issue. It's go get counseling, go get therapy, go to the center, get all the things that you need. But when one person loses bodily autonomy in a community, that whole community suffers. And if we don't start thinking about it from that perspective, we will have survivors just out here trying to fend for themselves, and that's not the way, this is not our burden to carry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think you were the first person to get to a microphone, so we'll start over here, then we'll go over here, and then we'll go up. Oh, okay. Remember, be brief <laughs> and with a question mark. Is this and on? tell us who oh, you yes. are, please. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Catherine Williams. I'm a student at HKS. Um, my question is about how HKS and CPL can show courage and that mm. personal responsibility. So HKS and CPL have several connections to people who are professionally and personally connected to Epstein. Mm. 
and moving forward, how can, how can we address those tensions? How can we move forward and have institutional accountability for that? Well, I thank think you. you have to, thank you for that. But I think that you have to have transparency, right? Courage in a lot of places, especially in institutions, looks like, often just looks like transparency. I'm sure that they didn't go out recruiting people, right? This is, this is something that happens. I'm, I got to the point where I didn't even want to take pictures with men sometimes, because I'm like, I don't want this popping up on me 10 years from now and if something comes out, whatever. So you don't often know, it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's get a group shot. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, you don't, you don't often know. But once you know, it's your responsibility to be transparent, to be really clear, to listen to what people are, are what the students, whoever the people are affected, are, are asking for. So at this point, once the administration, once the people who make decisions know, there should be a meeting set up, right? So what is it that we can do? Oftentimes, I think we think, administrators just know they're going to make whatever if they don't hear from the students they're going to make whatever decision feels best for them or no decision at all and so i think you make your voice heard about it and say listen we we get excuse me that you may not have known this but now that we know we have to deal with this up front it's just i, I was in a situation about epstein last year because he he he's, he was everywhere right this man was this is how the folks do they all know each other and they blah 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 and I got an award from another school that was connected to Epstein. And God help me, when I found that out, I'm like, I, mean, I can't get away from it, you know? Um, but, and that school did not handle it well. So I hope that Harvard will handle that in a way that, that feels um, courageous. And, and I think once you show courage, you'll see that people will meet you right where you are. You just, they just want to see you take that first step and say, I'm not going to hide behind this. I'm not going to cower. I'm going to face, you know, face it head on because this is an important issue to us. And it sends a signal to the rest of the school and the other, you know, the community. The, uh, like I said, Harvard is an example for other institutions. This is how you do this. You, you, head it, you, you, you look it dead in the eye and say, we made a mistake or we took too long or whatever the thing is, but here's what we're going to do moving forward. And I hope that happens. You're welcome. <laughs> Please, ma'am. Sure. My name is Laverne Gordon. I run a nonprofit called Love Life Now. We promote year round awareness against domestic violence. Mm. And the idea of domestic violence and sexual assault, oftentimes they intertwine, right? Yeah. And so I come into contact. I'm not on the front line, I'm not aiding uh, victims and survivors in shelter. But again, we, we try to point people in the right direction for help, among other things. And so a lot of the times we come into contact with survivors of sexual assault that, like you said, do not feel committed or connected to the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, is how do we, on a ground level, doing this work, how do we sort of, sort of work towards getting folks, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, so mm -hmm. I'll put that out there. So I come to this work from a personal level, but like I said, as it relates to sexual assault, how do we, on a ground level, help people get to that level, do you ever think it will ever funnel through or trickle down to communities of color? Absolutely. This is affecting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Um, and it's because of the mainstreaming of Me Too that that's happened, right? And so people don't really know what it is. They don't know. They have this idea that it's a thing that started online. It's out. That, that's, to, that's here to take down powerful white men. And so why would you feel connected to that? It has nothing to do with you. They're not gonna take down your boss or your coach or your uncle. They're not here to do that. And so what people who know, like you, when you get this information, you have to say, no, this is about resources. Look at their website, listen to these talks, whatever, and point them in the right direction. Our work, our programs, that we've taken two years to really work hard to build out programs specifically so that we are hitting marginalized groups first and so that we get to the people who usually don't get the resources first. And I, and I hope over the next like, year or so that'll start changing as people see the work in their community. Because rightfully so, if you only see me on TV every now and again, <laughs> and when you hear me too, you see hashtags and you know, rich white men, why would you feel connected to that? So I don't blame people for that. This, and this, this is not enough information. So if you can help 
when, and that's for everybody. When people ask me what can they do, talk about this movement differently. Say what you see on television is not the movement. What the media has told you is not the movement. The movement is on the ground, it's in communities, and it's, and it's community-based and focused. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have oh. another community resource up there. <laughs> Hi. Hi, um, my name is Erica Perez. I work for the Network Lared, which is a survivor-led organization that um, helps survivors of partner abuse or mm. domestic violence in LGBTQ and SM communities, and poly too. Um, so my question is, um, how do you think the experiences of gender non-conforming folks and non-binary folks and transgender folks fit into the whole Me Too, Me Too movement? Well, you know, I always drag, drag, I always drag out my child at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> this is my credibility badge. I'm like the white person who got a black friend. <laughs> I'm like, I got a queer daughter. <laughs> they don't mind. <laughs> but the reason why that's important is because I'm very clear that how my work, how my work was shaped prior to my child being out and queer and after has changed dramatically. And so I see the holes in the work, I see the holes in the movement at, at large, and I, and, ooh, ooh, sorry, I forgot I can't do that. <laughs> in my own capacity, I try to bring that conversation to the forefront, but I think that it is gonna take some, in, just some real intention that is sort of missing. And it's not just, I mean, I can say the same thing about disabled folks, I can say the same thing about indigenous folks, like there are these tracks that people are on and it's, and it's sort of separated, um, not sort of, it's very separated and until we kind of figure out how to converge those and say we're working towards the same thing but we have different needs, then I think it'll be, a, we can have a more cohesive movement happening. There's a lot of we're not included, we're not included, we're not included and I try to get people to say, you are a part of this movement. You don't have to be tagged in, you don't have to be pledged, you are part of this movement if you say you are, and take ownership of it in that way. But I do recognize there are barriers to being like the, at the forefront and, the, and the, the voice of. But I'm, I'm learning on a regular basis and trying to do a, a better and better job and, and bring other people and do a better, better job and not like saying, oh, and, <laughs> and we got some queer people in here, don't forget the queer people. Um, and, and it be a part, a, an organic part of the conversation. But yeah, I, I recognize there's a lot of work to do around that. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Jackie Rotman. First of all, thank you so much for the impact you've had on so many of us. I'm deeply grateful for you. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you about alternative justice. You mm. talked a lot about how not all survivors want punitive responses. We want healing and justice. Mm. When I was raped at Harvard three years ago, I wanted a restorative justice process and was told that the university was at least 10 years away from ever being able to offer something like that. So how do we build a culture that sees justice as more than the way that it's largely been depicted and creates options for survivors? How do we change the, our thinking as a culture in ways that allow for more options for justice? Girl, if I had the answer to that, we would be further ahead in this work. I mean, I, we are, I have my own beliefs around, and that include restorative and transformative justice. One of the things that I have had to, but I've, also, I've always struggled because of my work around sexual violence. And I'm really, I try to be transparent about that. I don't believe that the judicial process is here to serve us. Both from a standpoint of the, that the process is, is um, the judicial system is corrupted, but also that the laws are so narrow that they do not cover the breadth of what sexual violence is and does. And I have talked a lot recently about shifting this framework. So the how is the real heavy lift. And I think it is just, some of the ways I think we do it is like I said in these institutions, if we can have institutions start to model how they work, because you can create incubators where you can try these things out. One of, there's an organization, which I'm gonna forget, out of Chicago, um, that, that, that used this restorative justice um, process in their community, and it worked so beautifully, and they're writing about it, and they built a curriculum around it. 
And they just, you know, things like that have to happen. We have to try out these different models and see what works. And I think part of it is because people don't listen to survivors. You know, they don't listen to us. We're so, we're always engaged from a place of pity. And, and like, we just need services, but we don't have information about how a, a way forward. And so I think one of the hows that people need to start listening to survivors more, listening to what we say we want and what we need, and we have to start thinking, and part of what we need to articulate when they listen to us is that the crime and punishment framework doesn't work. It just doesn't work. For, and, and a big part of that is because so much of the harm that is caused doesn't rise to the level of crime. And so that if you harm a person, just, just in life, if you harm a person, there should be some accountability for the harm that you caused. So if we move to a framework that was about harm and harm reduction, then we have a, a wider breadth of options to work from when it comes to accountability. I can run that off like nothing, right? <laughs> Putting that into practice is the part that's just difficult. And I, I would love to see more colleges and universities be the, the start to that so that we can have a study and we can say, look, this is working here and here and here in these different places. Let's maybe model that in our prisons. Let's maybe model that like in these different places and just build out from there. But I, I believe, you know, 10 years is probably generous. Honestly, you know, and hopefully we, we can speed that number up um, in places like Harvard so that pe we can say, look what Harvard has done. <laughs> you know, look at this amazing thing. They did this project. They piloted for two years and had all these amazing results. We want to do that at Yale. <laughs> She's, you've got our number. <laughs> So. But thank you for that question. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I did not mean to say that no man can't ask a question. <laughs> I was going to say, you're not going to have that problem here. <laughs> no, 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 no. So anyway, please, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Chrissy. I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School and a Gleitzman Fellow. Um, and I'm so grateful for <coughs> your work me. and particularly um, seeing your work play out um, as I came of age as a, a woman in the workplace. Mm. Um, I worked on Capitol Hill when Kavanaugh was... Um, appointed to the Supreme Court. Mm. And um, I think that I have seen a lot of progress in the way that people talk about this, um, but something that I have not been able to break through is, and I think is one of the most upsetting um, responses to, to, to talking about this is um, that young men need to be careful nowadays because <laughs> a woman could just decide to ruin their lives. Mm. Um, and, and how do you respond to that? Because I've found that there is almost nothing that breaks through that. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of the way I break through, that, if I'm inclined to have the conversation, <laughs> part of the way I break through is to talk about the reality of what the work is. And I've had conversations with mothers. It's like, well, I have a son, and I'm worried about my son. And I said, well, if you are really worried about your son, I hope you're having conversations with your son about boundaries and consent and respect and having an ongoing conversation. Because honestly, what, what some of the demand is when we are talking about changing how we operate around sexual violence is that we want investigation. We want people to be taken seriously. We want for somebody that when they make a claim that they're not told you don't want to pursue this or you don't want to really go down this road because blah, blah, blah. Those investigations, those things are really, they'll, they'll help your child. So if your child is, you know, didn't do anything, go through a process and let's see what, where we come on the other end. But also, I think some of what we were talking, I was talking about to this young person here, follow me, I'm not being hypocritical, but just follow me for a second. Some of what I also see on college campuses is this idea, oh, and, and not just on college campuses, is this idea if men and boys would just change, that this would all end. This would all be over and we would, we, life can go on and there'd be no sexual violence. And that's just not true. One, because men and boys are also survivors. Right, And we have to acknowledge this is not a woman's movement, it's a survivor's movement. And so I think sometimes when we, when we talk about the breadth of the work and include the fact that men are both survivors, men are allies, and most men aren't, blah, 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 it makes people feel a little more comfortable. Um, but there, there are some ways, I think, that we have to restructure the way we talk about what's needed to end sexual violence that doesn't center male behavior alone that I think would help ease 
other people when they when they hear the way we talk about the movement, right? Women can be sex, obviously sexist, misogynist. We all were raised in patriarchy and carry patriarchal ideas and to a certain extent. And so all of that has to be unlearned and undone. And I, I know, again, on college campuses, I see, I ask girls this all the time. We ask the boys about, you know, um, how many of you, a lot of them say, I'm a good guy, and I would never, I would never, I would never. And I ask them, well, what about rape jokes? You know, do you laugh at rape jokes? And I, but then I ask the girls, how many of you have called a girl a slut based on random information that you heard about her? That is also upholding rape culture, right? And so there are, we have to look at the whole picture and not just make it centered around male behavior. And I think, I, you know, I'm not really here to appease those people, <laughs> to be quite honest. But I do think, I do understand because of the, the, the hype around it, people have all these, this bad information and false notions around it. But you know, raise your sons well, you won't have anything to worry about, <laughs> maybe. And yeah, I'm sorry, That's, this is a bad answer probably, but I hope I helped you a little bit. Okay, good. <laughs> Over here. I think Hi. we'll have time for oh, here, sorry. here, and there. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name's Bargavi. I'm a first year at the college, and I actually heard you speak with at Latasha Brown study group last semester. Oh yeah, that was great. Yeah, and what you said to me back then, like, actually, really impacted me in a very like positive way. So like, oh, thank yeah. you for that. Uh, but I wanted to ask about like the generational trauma that can happen in families and communities, hmm. and how like you know what happened to me happened to my mother, to my father, to her mother. And regardless of like an individual's experience, it's like ingrained in you, um, in the norms of your culture. And how do you begin to like push back against that and uh, like counter those norms or have those very difficult conversations with like the people closest to you when it has been like not spoken about for centuries yeah. before then? Listen. <laughs> It's just, as you know, because you're asking the question, it is really hard. One of the things that I am so um, in awe of and really proud of when I see your generation, this generation of young people is so different and, and really um, bold and courageous in a way that, I, that, is, that is changing some of these norms. And so I see a lot of young people, you know, students your age group who, will just, who are just like, this is enough and are pushing through to have these different conversations or just operating differently. And by that, I mean, you know, there are ways that we, I talk about this a lot, and particularly in communities of color, we raise our girls in particular um, with a set of rules, but not a lot of, um, I don't know what the right word is, but, but many of you will, will recognize this, right? We, we get raised and told, don't sit on a man's lap. Right? How many times have we heard that you never sit on a man's lap, you never put some clothes on when a man comes by the house, all of these kind of things, but you're never told why. You're never told what, what am I protecting myself from and why is this person, is this person bad? Like we don't get into those kind of conversations and what I see happening with younger people is they're asking those questions and they're pushing back and they're you know, standing in that. That's not always possible. Culturally, that's just not always possible, right? I love when people tell me, well, why didn't you just tell your mother? I'm like, tell my mother what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, nothing. Just, and so, so I get that. I get that. I, I think that the other piece is if you are in a situation where you can't, sometimes you have to find community outside of family to get that strength from and find other people who are maybe culturally have the same background that you can, you know, build some, um, some, do some problem solving with them. Because I can stand here and tell you a bunch of things and, and you might be like, that wouldn't work in my family. But if you got together with folks who have a similar situation and try to think about how to break through, or if you can't get it from the family to get it in other places, which is hard. It's hard to hear that sometimes, but it's, it's just the reality. I won't get, I don't ever think I'll get from my mother what I, what I needed, right? I can't go back in time and get what I needed. I love her. I cherish her, I think she's an amazing person, but I had to go somewhere else to get that. And, and you know, just, that's just my reality. So because I know we're at seven o'clock, but we have people who are desperate to ask their questions, what I want the you one. to do is real quickly, 
if you'll do your question, but real quickly, <laughs> Mike, you do your question real quickly. You do your question real quickly. Is then I gonna remember you all answer whatever. I'll write it down <laughs> okay, for you. Okay. Then you can answer whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, Go okay. ahead, real quick. <laughs> Hi, I'm a, my name's Anushka, and I'm a junior at Brookline High School, and I'm oh. also an intern at BARC, which is the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. Okay. And my parents are originally from India, and I know that's a country where really there's so much um, <laughs> <laughs> sexual violence and domestic violence. And so my question is, how can we extend the Me Too movement worldwide and oh, good affect question. Good question. Okay. Good. Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mike Jeppes. I'm an MPP at Harvard Kennedy School. My question is on behalf of the Harvard Graduate Student Union, which is that the students went on strike for over a month across Harvard University, mm -hmm. seeking protections against racial discrimination and violence and sexual assault and sexual harassment. Harvard has continued to fail to meet those demands. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the policies that would be approved are enforceable by court, not just by school policy. What do you think might be some factors that are encouraging Harvard to be so antagonistic towards survivors across the students? Wait, towards survivors, you said? Towards survivors who are also graduate students by not supporting sexual harassment and sexual assault policies that could protect those students. Okay. This is the debate, uh, the negotiation between the Graduate Student Union and the administration, okay. particularly around Title IX sexual harassment and so forth, and they haven't been able to come to an agreement. Is well, that a fair, fair point, Mike? And okay. down here, you can ask real quickly. Hi, I'm Madiha. I am from the Graduate School of Education retweet, Mike, about the <laughs> Graduate Student Union. Um, I, you've mentioned a few times about institutions having courage. Mm -hmm. In my experience, institutions don't have courage, mm -hmm. individuals do, and they have to put pressure on the institutions um, so that they can act um, accordingly. I'm wondering, um, in your work, what have, what have you observed at the local level that, is, that have been effective means of putting pressure on institutions or organizations? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm also curious about your thoughts on more vigilante forms of justice, such as when communities decide to um, <laughs> air um, to out um, perpetrators of violence. Um, mm. Yeah. Got it. So okay. the questions are, how do you take the Me Too movement worldwide? Mm -hmm. uh, any suggestions for the negotiation going on to get Harvard to meet some of the needs that the students have put forward around sexual harassment? Uh, and um, local level pressure and vigilante pressure <laughs> as a tactic, a method to deal with some of these issues. Okay, I'll work backwards, because I think this answer is connected to this answer, which is, I'm not sure how much organizing is happening around this. I know there was some in this December, because that's when we were originally supposed to have this. Organizing is always my answer. It's, my, it's what I default to. When you, can't, when you need to put pressure on people and you need to push them to be courageous, you have to organize. And I would say that, particularly because this generation has so many more resources that we, than we had, you need to think differently about organizing. I'm, I, and it, it's not always gonna be, you know, protesting or sitting in or whatever. So get together, um, get, get some people in the room who people wouldn't expect you to sit down with or amongst the student body. You know, maybe the, I don't know how this breaks out. But you know, the Black Student Union should be talking to the sororities or whoever the heck, right? But get some people in the room who have similar issues, but maybe are come from different places, and and think of some new and innovative ways to push back, because you can hold, the, you have power, and and the thing I say to college students all the time is, you have power now. You don't have to wait till you graduate. You don't have to wait till you finish. You got a power in your pocketbook because you pay tuition. Right? You have, there are so many different ways in which you have power. You need to sit down and examine what those are and use that power to push back. People, they will, they obviously hear you. They hear you. And I know the negotiations are going on and, and, you know, we'll see what happens on the other end. I wouldn't, I don't want to, I don't know enough about it to say that they're not trying to protect survivors. I'm sure there's some money, something in there somewhere. There always is. And, you know, just keep pushing until you get to the, to what the nugget is. What is the thing? I don't know what it is at all, but I'm sh I know there's a thing. <laughs> it's always a thing. Um, and just be relentless about that. You know, just how much are you, how far are you willing to go and how much pressure are you willing to put on? I, I damn near didn't graduate from school <laughs> because I was putting on pressure. And now I'm 40 something years old, like maybe I should have stepped back a little bit, but I don't, no regrets. Um, I don't know about vigilante justice. I think that, um, 
I've seen some of the, the calling out of like, you know, there's been schools where they've listed the names of professors who have, and I think that has sparked other people to come forward. I just, I just think I probably have to give some more thought to, to where I really stand on something like that because it also can be dangerous for, for the people. Like I think you can put yourself in a position that could, be, that could potentially be dangerous. And I, I think as I've gotten older, <laughs> some of the danger that I was okay with, I don't want my child to be in danger. So I'm like, wait, don't do that. Um, but I, you know, you have to be, vigilante is a strong word. And so you have to be very careful about how you put yourself back in proximity to be harmed again, um, particularly if you've experienced some kind of harm. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'd have to see more examples of what that looked like. Um, calling out might not be too bad, but just make sure you're protected. And, and also, you know, there's a thing about protecting the people, right? We, we, there's just too much at risk, I think, sometimes when we do that. But sometimes it's a, it's a measure we keep doing it, sorry. It's a measure we have to just take. Uh-oh, did I mess up? You got it back. Okay, here we go. Okay. Me too around the world. Oh, that's the easy question. Okay, so <laughs> where'd you go? Oh, hi. <laughs> so we are launching a global network. I am, we, we actually are, now I'm telling you this big secret, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be in Rwanda in April to, as the kickoff to our global network that is gonna include 10 countries to start with. One of them is India. Um, we connected with the people. The beautiful thing about Me Too going viral in other countries in particular was that for so many other countries, you know, there are places like the UN and UNICEF who do big work in these countries, right? But a lot of time it just doesn't reach the ground. And with Me Too, the hashtag and, and, and other countries, it was everyday people using this hashtag, starting their own little movements online. Excuse me, and it was it was democratizing, right? And and so we reached out to some of the people who started hashtags in their country, or they reached out to us. And these are everyday folks who just want to learn how to do this work. And that's really exciting because we get to create sort of a global grassroots movement. And so part of what we are doing is this listening tour. To, to you know, I've been to Australia. Um, Sweden is off the map with me too. It's just it's really amazing what they're doing out there. Um, and we're going to Rwanda, South Africa, India, Ghana, I'm probably not, I don't know, Belize, someplace hot. But <laughs> there is, um, to expand this work and, and particularly dealing with people who started these hashtags online and have a, a, a little cadre of folks that want to learn and build the movement out. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we could probably go all evening. <laughs> um, I think for me, all day today and this evening, and hopefully for a little while longer this evening, <laughs> I've learned to listen in a different way. I think many of us have different kinds of survivor stories. Mm -hmm. And to reflect on that and to figure out how to organize and how to get things done on the ground for that healing that you have spent your life committed to. I'm so incredibly proud to be part of the process that led to your becoming the Gleitzman Award winner this year. Thank you. And I hope you all will join me in thanking Tarana for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give me you a cut. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I just going to go sit down now? Am I going to sit down now?